I'm really excited to welcome our first speaker. So our first speaker is Ben Newman from the Meteor core team. Before joining Meteor, Ben worked on React and other developer tools at Facebook. He has also worked at Mebo, Apture, Mozilla, and Quora. A common thread that runs through Ben's career is a passion for exploring the limits of dynamic programming languages. And Ben actually represents Meteor in the TC39 JavaScript standards process. And he'll be telling you about uh, ES2 ES 2015, which is the upcoming new version of the ECMAScript standard that the JavaScript language is based upon. Everyone, please welcome Ben. Hi. Thanks for that, Alice. Um, this is better attended than some conference talks that I've, I've given. <laughs> so this is really great. There's a lot of energy in the room. Um, I'm Ben Newman, uh, as it turns out. And you can find me on most forms of social media as Benjamin with Althe I, um, in case you want to follow up on this. And what else can I say that Alice has not already said? Yes, I did work at Facebook. I've been at Meteor now for about 11 months, and I love it. Um, getting to do many of the same things, including being on the standards committee for JavaScript, that TC39 committee. Um, got to do that at Facebook. and persuaded Meteor to uh, become a member organization of the committee so that I could keep doing it here. Um, so that meeting, actually the most recent of those meetings, was happening this week. Um, and so that dovetailed nicely with some of the things I'm going to be talking about tonight. Um, I feel like we have an, uh, an obligation to try to explain what we find exciting about the work that we do, uh, especially to people who don't have as much context as we do. Um, and so I wonder if you've ever tried explaining Meteor without saying something about JavaScript. It's pretty hard. Most of our marketing material uh, is pretty heavy on the fact that it is a, for instance, JavaScript app platform, that it is a complete open source platform for building web and mobile apps. That's all fairly generic up until now when we tell you that it's, a pure, uh, it's for building them in pure JavaScript. So there's something about this that is inescapable. Um, about what makes Meteor Meteor. And yet, you have to wonder what exactly you're talking about when you talk about JavaScript. Uh, it's a term that's been around since 1995. You may think of it as that language that runs in web browsers, the one that hasn't changed all that much since the early 2000s. And uh, that's no longer a fair thing to say, but this idea is still floating around. If you know a little bit more about how JavaScript is written these days, and I'm sure most of you do. You may know that it is the language that puts the JS in node.js. But which version of Node are we talking about? If somebody really knows their stuff and you tell them that Meteor is a JavaScript platform and that it uses Node on the server side, they may wonder you know, if you're using version 10 or 11 or 12 or IOJS. How much of the standard library actually works according to the language specification, and which specification are we talking about? Um, can you run the same browser, the same code in a web browser? What kind of module system does Meteor support? What's the deal with fibers? Probably won't get that question, but you may be wondering what is the deal with fibers. And if we take a step back, it is actually, I think, somewhat remarkable that all of these questions have definite answers. Anything someone could ask you about Meteor is a question you can probably answer at a technical level. That doesn't mean that the answer is obvious, but I like to say that one of the most valuable things about a programming language is that everyone, in principle, can agree precisely what will happen when a computer runs a program that's written in that language. And that's incredible because the other kinds of languages that we have, natural languages, certainly don't have that property. Everyone understands their own particular meanings, and you have to fall back on context or asking questions, having a dialogue if you don't understand what somebody has told you. But this property of programming languages means that computers can do their work very quickly, and you can write some code that solves a problem and give that code to someone else, and they can run the code and see that it solves the problem, even without understanding how it works. And if they do want to understand how it works, they can dig into it and answer that question at every conceivable level, because it is all uh, so precise. So although I hope I've sown some doubt about exactly what is referred to by JavaScript, 
I do want to clarify that that term still conveys much of the necessary information. It's still one of the most useful ways of getting across this important part of Meteor. Uh, even though JavaScript may be a little bit vague these days, there's still a vast audience of programmers who know it by that name, and so we're going to keep calling it that for the foreseeable future. But programming languages change, and this is great news, because JavaScript used to be a language that people thought would never change, and that was the most depressing thing about it. And JavaScript is actually changing faster than ever these days. Uh, one of the ways that it is changing is that it has a new name, technically. The European Computer Machinery Association is the standards body that publishes the, uh, the ECMAScript standard, uh, which is how JavaScript is supposed to work now. And so they've given their name to the language. It's called ECMAScript. This is not uh, just the second name of the language. It was originally called Mocha or MochaScript and then rebranded at the, the last minute in 1995 at Netscape uh, to JavaScript, because that sounded like Java, as you may know. Uh, but now it's ECMAScript, and this seems here to stay. But more precisely, it is ECMAScript 2015, um, which may scare you if uh, you're used to, say, Windows um, operating systems <laughs> versioning and like still using Windows 98 in 2007. Like that's a bad situation to be in. But I know that the TC39 committee knows that. And actually, this is great because this departure from sequential numbering creates a pressure or at least signals an intention of the committee that they will release a new standard every year, <laughs> you know, because every year that goes by makes the name of the language look more and more dated. So this is a sign that things are picking up. It's easier than ever to propose new language features, get consensus built around those proposals. And this is a link, just in case you, oh, I don't even know where that tab opened. Um, OK. Let's, oh, there it is. Yeah. Um, how do we get to that? So this is a list of all of the current cutting edge proposals in their various stages of acceptance. Um, if you've ever wanted to acquaint yourself with um, what's coming up, the TC39 repository on GitHub, ECMA 262 repository, is where all that's stored. As an example, the regular expression escape method uh, was revived just last month on the ES Discuss mailing list and got presented in this week's TC39 meeting and is uh, almost at the uh, level of, of being on track for standardization, which is amazing to me, uh, because actually this was proposed more than five years ago for the first time on that mailing list. And so uh, the TC39 committee has not always been able to turn things around this quickly, but now, you know, within a month, they can consider a significant addition to the language and make progress on it. So this is all getting so much better. There are, of course, multiple levels of implementation of these ideas. It's not enough to just write in a standard that something should exist, although that's an important first step. Uh, after that, you might hope that transpilers like Tracer or Babel would uh, pick up the feature and allow you to simulate it then maybe you would hope for native support in Node. Um, that's good for us, because Meter uses Node on the server side. So for server side code, that would allow us to use new features, perhaps more efficiently. And then native support will eventually make it into at least some browsers. And finally, native support everywhere is the goal that we're shooting for. But one of my arguments tonight is that that may be a long way off, and that's not a reason to worry. So our commitment at Meteor um, is that through a package called ECMAScript um, that we're going to be providing in Meteor 1.2, we're going to provide any and all language features that can be faithfully compiled to code that runs natively in all JavaScript engines. So if you think about it, there are sort of two kinds of progress here. First. Meteor might provide uh, simulated support for some new feature of JavaScript that's been proposed but not implemented in Node or browsers. And so we're sort of um, pushing the state of the art forward in that direction. But then lagging behind that by maybe months or years, native support hopefully will catch up with the simulation. Um, that's the hope, at least. So 
uh, as long as what we are implementing are features that are destined to become part of the language, then eventually we will no longer have to simulate them. And we'll be able to transition to relying on native support. It may take a while, but it's sort of a double-ended uh, queue of progress here. The principle that I'd, I'd like to leave you with, our sort of litmus test for whether it's worth supporting a feature, is that if we start supporting a new language feature, and trust me, there will be examples of this in a, in a second. I know this is pretty abstract right now. If we support a language feature, like say, classes, um, and you start writing code using classes, you should not have to rewrite that code when native support finally catches up. Right? It's OK if there are some things uh, involved in classes that you can't do yet. You just can't write that code yet and have it work. That's fine, because then you'll eventually be able to do that when native support gets here. But the thing we want to avoid is like uh, luring you into doing something that seems OK right now, but then once you know, the future is finally here, needs to be uh, revamped. OK. so. Uh, We've been using ECMAScript 2015 in the code that implements the Meteor command line tool for some time now, and it's really great. Um, so I want to show you an example of the kind of simplification that we've been able to reap with this new syntax. How great is it? Well, here is some code that defines something like a class called JS file. Um, and I'm going to iteratively like, remove and rearrange parts of it to show you how you can successively apply ECMAScript features to make it simpler. Right? So what is it doing? There's a constructor function. It's invoking a superclass constructor. And then you're setting up the prototype chain, making sure that instance of works by assigning to the constructor property of the prototype. And then it, the class only has one method, add JavaScript. Um, and it takes some options and does something with them. And then this is in a common JS file, so we're exporting the, the, the class so that it can be used in other files, right? So this is a fairly common idiom, as horrendous as, as it may be. And it's sort of a lie. We do have, at least right now, a, uh, a convenience for the prototype chain stuff. So that can be replaced with meteor.inherits. Um, but as you can tell, that's not exactly a public API. right? So that's not good enough. That's really not good enough. So what we can do here is take. Um, the constructor function and turn it into a class with a constructor method that still does the same thing as the original constructor function. Um, and so that's maybe progress. Uh, then we can take the um, invocation, oops, the invocation of the uh, superclass constructor and turn it into a supercall. So that's a nice syntax that's now available. It's a, you know, a few uh, characters shorter. We can move the add JavaScript method inside the body of the class, as you're probably used to if you come from languages that actually have classes. And then if you have a constructor that only invokes the superclass constructor with the same arguments, you don't really need the constructor at all. So we can get rid of that and then tighten up some space. And here's one of my favorite parts. We, we have this pattern of having functions that take options objects just all throughout our code base. And it's really hard when you see that to then go look through the code beneath it and figure out what op options are actually used and, and what they do. So we can use parameter destructuring, which is a fancy word for naming your parameters. Uh, so now, instead of a simple parameter list, we have an open curly brace and then the keys that are accepted by that options object, which is great sort of self-documenting code. And then those properties become local variables. So um, we don't have to say options.data anymore or options.sourcemap. We just use the names of the properties. So that's a little better. Um, and in fact, there's a thing called uh, object literal shorthand, where if the key on the left-hand side is the same as the identifier on the right-hand side, you can actually omit the colon and the identifier. So can shorten that up a little bit. And now it's starting to look like you know, tall and narrow, and like maybe we just put it on the same line. Um, so making progress here. Um, great. So we still have this exports.js file um, thing, uh, which is a common JSism. Uh, but ECMAScript 2015 provides an even better syntax. So we can just export the class wherever we define it. 
and the class is still defined in the scope of the file here. It just happens also to be executed. It happens also to be exported. So that's getting pretty good. And the last thing I sort of hoped we could do is maybe reduce the repetition between the parameter list and what's being passed to the push method. But those are really two different things. The first is a list of parameters. The second is a list of arguments. So to show you that those can be different, if we wanted the source map parameter to be optional, you could provide an optional value for it, like null. OK? So made the code a little longer, but arguably better. So this got a lot shorter. We got a lot more white space to work with. And that's not the only metric of code quality by any means. Uh, but if you're like me, that's, that feels like a good sign, as long as you can still read the code. So we're pretty addicted to this. And we want you to have the same development experience. We'd be crazy if, having had this experience, we didn't also want to give it to you. Cool. OK, but how? I told you there was going to be an ECMAScript package. And there is. Um, and the way to use it is just to call Meteor add ECMAScript, basically. It's a lot like the existing CoffeeScript package in that sense. You can just add or remove it at whim. And we're confident enough that it's a good idea um, that you know, if you have an existing app, you can add or remove it, um, or you can api.use it in a package. But it will be installed by default for all new apps and packages as of Meteor 1.2. So when you say Meteor create my app, it'll just be in the .meteor slash packages file as a line that you could remove or look at. Um, so that's pretty cool. That means that going forward, uh, new apps will just automatically have this support. And I want to stop here and say that uh, none of this would be possible this quickly um, and at this level of quality without a project called Babel, which is the JavaScript transpiler that we are using. Um, so if you haven't heard of it, it's great. Um, its coverage is really complete uh, as in, in the sense of uh, faithfully transpiling what can be transpiled. It's, it's doing that more so than almost anything else. So uh, you should know that this is not all of all our work. It's, it's largely thanks to Babel. OK, so to, to answer the question, when somebody presses you, uh, what dialect of JavaScript does Meteor implement exactly? There are a few things you can say. One valid answer is the latest one. Uh, in other words, ECMAScript 2015, maybe plus, uh, 2016, 2017, hopefully coming down the pipe. Also, you could say, that Meteor implements whatever we can faithfully transpile of the latest version of JavaScript. That's a truthful answer. Whatever will one day be implemented natively, that's the hope. And whatever helps you write your Meteor apps more quickly and with less code. OK, so I want to explain what I mean about writing code that works today and having it continue to work in the future even if it doesn't work exactly the same way, if it's not implemented the same way today as it will be in the future, that transition from simulated to native support. So what I have in mind are four of loops. You might be familiar with four in loops, but four of loops will iterate over the elements of an array or of an iterator. So you can have a loop like this that iterates over an array and sums up its uh, elements. That'll get transpiled to something like this, which is not code you would have wanted to write by hand. But basically, what it's doing is, is invoking the symbol.iterator method of the array to get back a little um, iterator that has a next method that it can call repeatedly. And then it keeps calling that until next returns an object with done equal to true. Um, and the, the value of x in each iteration is uh, that object's value property. right? So. This is an example of what's going on behind the scenes. And if you really want to pick nits, the symbol.iterator thing that you see there is actually a special kind of unique property name that really can't be simulated in any way that I know of. Um, so we're just going to have to wait for native support. right? And you might think this would spell doom for four of loops. But it doesn't, thankfully. And why is that? Well. This code assumes not a full implementation of the symbol, 
uh, polyfill, but can make do with a fake one. So this is just a way of making sure that something that looks like symbol.iterator that we use in the same way as we would use the real thing is available. And this would be in a, in a library somewhere that's like loaded before all your other code. And as long as this is there, even if symbol.iterator is actually just a string and not this magical thing, um, then the four of loops will work. So in other words, the original four of loop works today in translation, although through some fakery. And it will continue to work natively, because it's just the same syntax once it no longer needs to be translated. So for that reason, four of loops meet our criteria for inclusion in the ECMAScript package. But symbols themselves don't, even though they are an implementation detail of four of loops. All right. Another example of something that Meteor can do especially well for you um, when it comes to ECMAScript 16. Or this is actually more of an ECMAScript 5, the previous version sort of thing. Array methods like for each and map and reduce are now available in literally almost every JavaScript engine, except, of course, older versions of IE8, in particular, Internet, 8 and Internet, Internet Explorer 8 and earlier. And we use a, or are starting to use a popular polyfill library called ES5 Shim to implement those methods when they're not available, which is great. Uh, we want people to be able to write code that assumes the existence of these methods and not have to be bitten when they go to test their code or when their users test their code in Internet Explorer 8. Um, but there's a catch, which is that there is actually no way to make those new methods invisible or non-enumerable on the array prototype. So why is that a problem? Well, if you ever use a for in loop to iterate over an array, I know that sounds crazy, in Internet Explorer 8, you'll get all those method names too. As an example, here's an array that just has two elements at the zeroth and second index. Um, so if you do a for in loop, you, you would expect that the index would only take on zero and two as, as values, but instead you get things like for each and every and um, reduce and so forth. So probably break whatever code you're working, uh, whatever code was using that pattern. So normally you'd be out of luck and you would just have to make that difficult trade-off that you, know, you don't really care about for end loops over arrays. You know, that's valid. Um, but you do care about array prototype methods and always having them all available. But this is actually a problem that Meteor can fix for you. Uh, how is that even possible? Well, it does this because it, it can do this because it controls the uh, compilation of your code when you have the ECMAScript package installed. So that sparse array argument of the for in loop can be wrapped with a helper function like the sanitize for in object. And what that might do is, in most browsers, nothing. It just returns the argument so it's like the original for in loop. But in IE8, and only when the argument is an array, it has the opportunity to return a new object that contains only the enumerable keys. So this is a crazy edge case um, that you probably wouldn't think about. Uh, at Facebook, we wanted to ship some array prototype polyfills, and <laughs> we released them on the site. You know, We thought it was a great idea. And then only after billions of users uh, used the, the site in Internet Explorer 8 and earlier uh, did we find out that there were actually four in loops over arrays in our code base, and they were broken because of this. So Meteor uh, can prevent that problem that even Facebook was bitten by. OK, another example. Um, I think maybe the high bit here is that we are providing a promise polyfill. So if you're familiar with promises at all, that's going to be built in along with the ECMAScript package. Uh, as well as set and map polyfills, if you're excited about those. But something that I am excited about and that may uh, excite you if you've ever tried to use promises with fibers in Meteor is that if you define a property called promise.fiber, then that will be used to ensure that all promise callbacks run in a fiber, so you can like call you know, your Mongo API or call meteor.call in the callback of a fiber, sorry, in the callback of a promise, and that'll just work, whereas previously you would have had to use meteor.bind uh, bind environment everywhere. Um, I think I'm going to gloss over the details of how that works. We're basically wrapping the then method of the promise. Um, 
Here are also some good promise tutorials if, if this has piqued your interest about promises. Um, and this is how that wrap callback function works. It runs the callbacks using fibers that are recycled in a pool, so you only ever need as many fibers as there are simultaneous promises pending, which is pretty cool. And even better, uh, you basically never have to use meteor.bind environment again if you are using promises. So if any of that makes sense, I hope it sounds like good news. Something that uh, will be easier to understand without as much context is uh, the question of source maps. So of course, we're providing source maps along with uh, compiled ECMAScript code. So if you can see this code over here, it's using some features like um, a let variable declaration, a computed property name in the, in the hello helper, um, and a method shorthand, so you don't have to say click button, colon, function, open, close, paren. You can just say click button, open, close, paren. And I've put a debugger statement in here so that the um, debugger will stop here when you click the button. This is just the, the basic example from creating a new app. And indeed, it stops here and shows you the code that you actually wrote instead of the code that was mangled by the Babel compiler. Right? So that's great. That's the ideal uh, development environment um, for this kind of thing. And it works great in Chrome and Firefox and Safari. But it doesn't work so well in uh, browsers that don't have source map support, obviously. Uh, so what can we do for you there? Well, if you don't have any source maps, first of all, Notice that this was line 13. So if you don't have any source maps, you would at least like to be able to figure out what line uh, the, the place where you stopped corresponds to in your original source file. So this is what it looks like if you're just looking at the raw underlying JavaScript. It's uglier. you know. It might still require some mental translation to imagine how these things correspond to what you actually wrote. But one thing is pretty easy to determine, which is if you look over in the right-hand column, these lines are annotated with the original line numbers. And those are derived from the same source map. But they work in all browsers because they're just JavaScript comments. So you can look over in that column and see that this was line 13 in the original code, even though now it's line 22. So I think that's pretty cool. If you ever find yourself having to debug your code in Internet Explorer 8, you'll hopefully thank us. So we think you shouldn't have to wait for universal native support before using the latest ECMAScript features. Uh, nor should you have to wonder when it's safe to transition from simulated to native support. That's the kind of call that we're like, in a position to make when it seems uh, like it's feasible to stop translating something and rely on native support. Nor should it be your job to figure out the best way to integrate libraries like ES5 Shem with tools like Babel. And this is, I feel like this is one of the problems with the JavaScript ecosystem today, is that you might try to use these two things together and run into a problem and not have any idea whose fault that is. Like, is it Babel's fault? Is it ES5 Shem's fault? Is it something about the way that you're using them together? So is it your fault? Well, I don't know. Um, and Meteor can be uh, sort of a place where these solutions accumulate, because we're sticking them together, right? So it's now it's our fault. So you can file issues on our issue tracker. Um, and if we fix those issues, and I hope we can fix those issues, then that will benefit everyone else who needs to use those things together under the umbrella of Meteor. And that's all possible because we provide this complete platform out of the box that includes compilation and packaging and delivery of scripts, libraries, source maps, and other assets, which puts us in this ideal position to make the transition as seamless as possible. So that's sort of why I left my job at Facebook um, to focus on that developer experience at a larger scale. There are a whole lot more of you uh, than there were engineers at Facebook. So I think it makes sense to work on an open source project that provides these things rather than uh, doing them just for the sake of a bunch of engineers working at a private company.
so we have about five minutes for Q&A. So if anyone has a question for Ben about anything that you just saw, please ask. Ben, if someone has a question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what do you think the biggest impact of uh, ECMAScript is going to be relative to the kinds of applications that you can build? Could you repeat the question? Yeah. Uh, what is going to be the biggest impact of ECMAScript that like enables you to build different or better applications? Um, that's a great question. Some of these things are definitely just ergonomic improvements. Arrow functions let you write functions more tersely. Um, classes are just another way of doing uh, something you could have done idiomatically before. Um, some things that I'm really excited about, though, are promises. I think that we, we have a complicated story for handling asynchronous code. Um, right now, and it hangs together. Like we've, we've managed to make it work for a long time with a combination of fibers on the server and a, a copy of your database, Minimongo, on, on the client. Um, and Minimongo is synchronous, while server code can use fibers to appear synchronous but actually be asynchronous. And um, we'll have to see how it goes, but I think that if we begin rethinking some of our APIs, like the Meteor call um, API for calling methods so that it can return a promise on both the client and the server, um, then, then you might be able to start writing code that, that truly is isomorphic in the sense that it, it works the same way on the client and server instead of just sort of looking the same. Um, so that's a big deal. Um, I don't know. I'm, I guess I'm asking uh, for your ongoing feedback. This is an early preview of the support. It seems like the right thing to do. But. In the list of proposals you had, you know, threading, basically, right? Or, or parallel JavaScript, that would be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there are some things that I, I think that would count as something that requires native support. Yeah. And so we would probably be able to provide it on the server sooner than on the client, and it might be a while before it's available everywhere. So we'd have to think hard about whether that inconsistency uh, was worth it and whether the difficulty of teaching those concepts justified the difficulty of learning them. Um, that's not the right trade-off, but uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm excited about uh, things like that, but we do have to think about how each of these features uh, actually improves Meteor code, which, to your original question, um, I, think, I think there's a lot left to be discovered there. Cool. Uh, more questions? And we need to use a new file extension. Ah, um, no. Uh, that, this is one of the things that has made this project's a little bit easier. Uh, you could previously register source handlers using the plugin API uh, for any file extension besides JS, so .coffee or .jsx. And that worked pretty well. It was remarkable how far you could get with that. But I think um, it's important that this package is now able to transpile just normal JavaScript files. Um, and it's nice that no one has been able to do that yet so that we're not actually stepping on any toes by making that possible. Uh, but it will be possible, actually, if you're you know, really industrious, to remove the ECMAScript package and implement your own version of it that also <coughs> uses the, the JavaScript file extension. There's nothing special about it. There's just a new um, plug-in API that is being released with Meteor 1.2, which is one of the reasons it's waiting on that. Anything else? A uh, question from Slava. Does the application model become really big because of constellation? Ah, so that is a factor that helps us decide whether it's worth supporting a given feature. So for instance, we are at the moment not uh, planning to include support for generators. Um, and I say that with uh, some bitter sweetness because I worked on the Regenerator project at Facebook, which is the way that Babel 
handles generators. Um, but it just turns generator functions into a lot of code that is hard to debug if you ever have to drop down into the, the meat of it. Um, so that's a case where, out of consideration for bundle size, we've decided to wait until we see a compelling use case for that feature in Meteor code. Um, and it is true that there is some runtime code that needs to be provided so that the generated code can do its thing. But whereas if you're just using Babel out of the box, it injects those runtime helper functions into every single file where they're used. We're able to centralize them into a single runtime library. So that's like a fixed cost that you pay. And then everywhere those helper functions get used, they get to assume the existence of those runtime helpers. So those are a couple of the things that we're doing to mitigate the not already terrible problem of uh, an increase in, in bundle size. Yeah? How much of an effect does the transpilation have on why it's below time? Ah, so. You repeat the question? Yes, OK, I should be doing that. Uh, how much of an effect does transpilation have on live reload time? So we use the same caching infrastructure that um, we uh, have been using for a long time. So when you change a file, only that file has to be transpiled. And um, I think in my initial tests, if you were to transpile everything that needed to be evaluated in order for your app to start up, um, that would take about 20 seconds, which is obviously unacceptable for reload time. But any single file is just a tiny fraction of that. So it's uh, pretty unnoticeable. It's on par with like the delay um, that the, the file watching code has already between when you make the change and when it picks up on it. So thankfully, no. Not much of an impact. Yeah. How does the uh, Xcode package impact the download size of the Meteor app? That's a good question. Uh, yes. Uh, how does the ECMAScript package impact the download size of your Meteor app? Um, two things I would say is if that turns out to be your primary concern, um, we're not forcing it on you, so you can remove it, <laughs> which is not, not a good answer. Uh, that makes it seem like we're more worried about it than we are. Um, I think the largest part of it, I'm, I'm almost certain of this, is uh, the, the Babel NPM package that implements the, the compiler. So um, if there are features of that that we don't end up using, suppose there's some, some gains to be had in like removing parts of that that we're sure aren't going to be used. But um, yeah, it's, it's the download time when you like update Meteor or install Meteor from scratch. So it's not the amount of time that you need to like create a new app or start your server or um, respond to a request. So I hope that. That's the right trade-off to make, but let us know if it's obnoxiously large. And we have one more question here. Uh, so with the new API, can we have multiple source transformation passes? For example, we use ESP to make Yes. Well, OK. Repeat the question. Can you have multiple uh, transpilation passes? Um, for instance, CoffeeScript uh, targeting ES 2015. Is that what you mean? Um, unfortunately, for simplicity's sake, I, I think the answer is no. Um, I mean, I, I know the answer is no, but uh, let's see. You can have different source handlers for different file extensions, if that's important to you. So you could have like a different source handler for coffee or JSX versus JS. Um, but if you want to do something other than what the ECMAScript package does for JavaScript, you should probably fork it and publish your own package and then remove the built-in ECMAScript package and, and publish or install your package instead. Right. Okay. There's yeah. some more questions. Yeah. Sure. Some websites serve different versions of JavaScript in browsers in terms of their capabilities. Yes. Um, I think that would be great. And I think if we did that, we would be solving a problem that is, is very difficult to, to solve by yourself. 
that probably involves some kind of user agent sniffing, um, potentially like sending a manifest of capabilities to the server so that you have multiple HTTP requests at the very beginning of loading the page. And maybe that's acceptable. Maybe um, if, you, if you really value uh, that efficiency and using native support as much as possible, then you'd be willing to pay an upfront cost in terms of page load time. Um, I know that the, the user agent sniffing technique is something that Facebook did for delivering different polyfills to different browsers. So it's feasible. Um, but for simplicity, it's not going to be the first version. Cool. So we'll take one more question, then next talk. Yeah, go. Right. Uh, who was uh, first? Uh, uh, JC. So okay. I have a question about the front end modules, because it seems like, like, like a new module system how you like export and import that to JS. And it seems to be like incompatible with what you are doing right now with this job. How would that work? This is a great question. Um, Repeat the question. Yes. So in the example that I showed, we used an export statement. Um, and also in the original code that I was transforming into that shorter code, there was an exports object that I was assigning a property to. And you probably realize that that is a common JS style module system turning into an ECMAScript 2015 style import export syntax. Um, and uh, the reason that is valid is that the code that that was taken from is just Node.js code. Like That's how we implement the Meteor command line tool. Um, that said, we are very interested in providing a module system uh, that is built on top of CommonJS, but that uses ECMAScript 2015 import-export syntax. Um, and we have a plan for uh, having that coexist with the, the package variable import-export system. So it's sort of like you could imagine having ECMAScript 2015 modules, and then also just your global variable assignments are intercepted and turned into package variables. And I think those two things are orthogonal enough that you can have them both. Your existing code will continue to work. You won't have to like rewrite everything to import a bunch of stuff at the top of your files. Um, but there's enough of a need for referring explicitly to other files using module syntax and importing specific properties um, that I think that's going to be a really high value thing for organizing your code. But okay. that's not going to be in the 1.2 release. All right. Thanks so much, Ben.